walk, hike, bike, play pickleball, play sports. You can build a healthy life and also include social fitness and social components to make it more fun. Fitness, health doesn't have to suck. Back when we started sending a random newsletter in 2019, no one was doing that. But the industry's valued at trillions of dollars. Do the basics really freaking well, and usually you'll win. Anthony, uh, welcome to the podcast. I wanted to kick things off uh, by a very simple question, but uh, a question that actually means a lot to me. And uh, I wanted to ask you what fitness means to you. Yeah, fitness to me is, uh, it's a simple thing when we first open our gyms. The term was uh, move more, eat better, and that's it. Well, it seems like uh, it uh, has expanded from there quite a bit because it seems like it's uh, taking the majority of your career today. It's your core focus. And I'm thoroughly yeah. excited about having an opportunity to chat with you about all the trends because that's what you cover in your newsletter. These are also the companies that you look at when it comes to your investing. So um, I'm very curious how that all evolved that you picked fitness as the industry to operate in. Yeah, it's always been fitness. Uh, my brother and I grew up in Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania, and football is a big deal here. So since we were in middle school, we were training and working out and running preparing for football. Um, and when you do that, we were fortunate that we had really good strength coach. And because of that, fitness was something we talked about, did, loved, whether it be training for sports, bodybuilding, other things, since we were teenagers, that's what we've done. And when uh, I joined the military out of high school and fitness became even more passion for me and my brother, same thing. He was a high school football coach and a trainer and other things. And as sports and fitness grew even more, Uh, when I hit 21, 22, I realized I can make a career out of it and never looked back. It's been 12 plus years of him and I working together, building a wide range of fitness and wellness and health businesses. But it was always, if you could do things that make money and help people live healthier lives, be active, have fun with it, why wouldn't you do that? You have gone through a big personal body transformation Uh, before joining the Marines. Is that right? Yeah, I, I've gone through a number of them over my life. Um, <laughs> was, it, was this one the most significant? Uh, yes, I've done it a couple times though. So I'm naturally a bigger person. My high school weight, I was a lineman. I weighed 260 plus. Um, right now I weigh probably about 190 and I went from 260 down to probably like 170, 160, uh, for the Marines. And it was pretty crazy, but because of th certain things in life, I've gone up again to gain weight and be a power lifter. I've gone down again to run marathons. So I've gone from 265. I think my heaviest was 270 down to the lowest I've been was 165, three or four times in my adult life, which is very unhealthy. I do not recommend it. Well, it seems like you have, like, of course, like it's probably not the healthiest to be making these big swings, but uh, it seems like you know what it takes to be able to to do that. What as as we are talking fitness, right? Uh, losing weight is on top of mind of a lot of people, and I would just love to hear what worked for you and what were some of the routines that uh, you set up to be able to do so? Yeah, it's why, you know, when you ask me about fitness, it's move more, eat better. Um, technically, we would always say move more, eat less as well, because, but that some people get upset about that. So I don't know. Um, it's very simple. You don't need anything fancy. You don't need a program or any, you know, special equipment or anything. You have to burn more calories than you consume and train specifically for the thing you're looking at. If you want to lose weight generally, it's weights and cardio. If you want to um, 
you know, for me, when I was training for races, running, I would run a lot more because I needed to be able to run more. Or when I was strictly on a weight loss plan, it was being a pretty decent calorie deficit while consuming the right amount of protein. Like it's science. It's basic. Anyone that tell there's like this whole thing online now where maybe people say that's not the case. It's a lie. It's just so people can feel better about themselves. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty basic and not to say that's not hard. It's insanely hard. I've battled weight issues when I was a kid and in my adult life. And there's a million reasons why you gain weight and why it's hard to lose weight and do other things. But if you're truly boiling it down, it's a pretty simple mathematical equation of burn more calories, eat less calories, train for specific reasons. And, um, but again, I don't recommend doing that. I like being at a normal, healthy weight where I can eat what I want and in a reasonable range and have pizza and still work out and train and, and be there. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's not that complicated, which is funny to say, cause our entire brand is built off of f- investing and talking about fitness businesses, which usually complicate things. Yeah. And like you have made this your core area of focus, right? So why do you think a lot of people struggle with it? Is it the motivation? Is it the dedication to stick with the things? Is it them being too comfortable? Is it a mix of all of that? Uh, you must have an interesting perspective as, uh, you know, uh, you have fitness businesses uh, all around you pretty much. Yeah, I think there's so many reasons. Access, affordability, knowledge, intimidation. Again, I, I say the things about being simple, but then I also can greatly relate to it's very scary if you're overweight and you want to go to a gym. It's complicated. You're sold products and plans and nutrition and there's billions of dollars spent to try to market weird products to you and think you need to follow diet X or diet Y or certain things. So, um, there's so many reasons why, and I never judge anyone for having issues or battling weight or training or, you know, movement issues. Um, and in reality, I think most people just aren't aware and hopefully the industry as a whole is making it easily accessible, more affordable, and, um, something that people can attain because it also is very perceived as unattainable to have those things, but it's not. And I think as a market, the fitness and wellness industry has done a really bad job of look at the numbers, people, more people are overweight, more money spent and the market's bigger, but then more people are overweight and obese and have diseases and problems and movement issues and they move less and they don't get the steps and all that fun stuff. So it's a very complicated issue for sure. We have chatted about the weight, but uh, I know that uh, you have even some pers- very personal ties to why the health matters overall, right? Uh, yeah. Would you mind speaking about why this is something that truly resonates with you and why you set out uh, on building your career in, in fitness, which, you know, is a very big component of the overall health. Yeah, it was, you know, originally my dad passed away from brain cancer and, um, it wasn't, there was no reason why it happened, but when you see somebody's health deteriorate and their ability to function deteriorate, you start to realize if you don't have your health, you don't really have anything, no matter what you do from a money work career things, possessions, it doesn't matter if you're not healthy and you're not there to enjoy it or be around with the people you love. So that was one of the first glimpses of like, this is hard to see. And then realizing that if I had the knowledge I have today, or we had access to the things that are out there today, his life could have been better from not maybe not live longer, but enjoy the time that he was around. If he had a higher level of fitness and, you know, different approach to nutrition, maybe things could have been easier. Um, you know, access to certain supplements and medicine and other things. So yeah, it boils down to, for me at least, if you don't have your health, nothing really matters. And there's a lot of people and it's not about weight. Like I was saying, it's more about just your overall health and how you feel and how you move. And if you don't have those things, life is hard and kind of sucks. And if you can, if, if for some people, for a lot of people, there are things that you can't change. It's hard to do. It's complicated. It's intimidating. All the things I said, but 
if you can make those changes and improve how you live, how you feel, how you move, the the enjoyment of life through that, I mean, why wouldn't you do that? And that was kind of the inspiration of it all was like, I want to feel better. I want to help people feel better. And it, it's more about just a more enjoyable and um, fulfilling life through health and wellness, which is true. If you feel better, you look better, you can do more things, you can be more active. Um, in, in the end, it's it's better. I find it very inspiring that we are talking about fitness, but we are also on the intersection of uh you and uh, your brother making a big business out of that, right? Because in the end, it's an intersection of uh, doing uh, business and being an entrepreneur in fitness, right? It's not just that you would be taking care of yourself, but you are uh, helping and you are inspiring a lot of other people to uh, think about how they could apply those things to their lives and how they could apply those things to their businesses as well mm -hmm. what 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 are some of the uh latest and greatest trends that you see uh popping in the space yeah i think active lifestyle is a big component people are realizing that it's not about fitness and cardio and lifting and weight loss it's about being active which is funny to say it's a trend when it was a thing many years ago but walk hike bike play pickleball, play sports, play pickup basketball. You can build a healthy life and also include social fitness and social components and make it more fun. Um, fitness, health doesn't have to suck. It can be an enjoyable part that is a big part of your life. Like for me, what's helped me stay at a healthy level of weight and just activity is I walk a ton. I have certain rituals and that I do to make sure that I get out and move. And then I play pickleball, play basketball, do other things with friends where I'm always being active and social. Um, so that's a big one. And then another one is personalized nutrition. Just understanding, you know, it's not about diets. It's about eating to make you feel better and for your specific body. What nutrition do you need? What supplements and vitamins do you need? What type of you know, food makes you feel a certain way and planning when you eat because some people can fast and some people can't. Some people eat breakfast and others don't like to. It's like personalizing your nutrition approach to better suit a lifestyle that you want is another one that, you know, we think is kind of massive. It's called personalized nutrition. Some people say like food is medicine. We've talked about that before in the newsletter, but it's using food as a fuel and value source generally to make you feel better, treat certain things that are wrong with you and help you just be better overall. I feel like there is a huge boom of uh, the healthy uh, food brands that uh, either do snacks or uh, they try to incorporate uh, different uh, supplements and adaptogens in uh, their products. To me, it feels like... Uh, Uh, this whole uh, plethora of products is is popping, and uh, uh, also it's probably uh, it goes hand in hand with uh, the demand of the people for for those products as well. Yeah, exactly. And that's but again, it goes back to like those things are are super cool. But then what all I'm saying is like pretty simple, and it's hard. It's a conflicting point for Joe and I because information is pretty simple, um, and. You don't need to sell and buy all these fancy things to do it. So it's like a, it's a constant battle in our head of like, we want really good businesses that make lots of money and do things and we can invest in them. But then we want everybody to understand and have access to the most basic version of living a healthy lifestyle. Well, something that you have said at the very beginning, right? When someone wants to lose weight, uh, that it's a fairly simple equation of uh, calories in, calories out. I know that uh, there are some caveats to that for sure. But uh, there is this, like, uh, I would say, uh, long time legacy, right? These are the basic principles uh, of how we operate as humans. But uh, on the other side of the spectrum, you have uh, the latest and greatest research. You have uh, people like Andrew Huberman that go very in depth on uh, particular areas. Like, do you 
keep up with uh, the latest research on those fronts? And do you try to also uh, cover it uh, as part of the newsletter or do you uh, rather focus on like the, the general things? No, absolutely. I mean, that's what we mostly do is the latest and greatest research. It's not from, you know, Huberman and Atia and all these guys that are experts and have the training and knowledge and, you know, actual background to do the research and spend the time. What we do is we look at those studies, we look at that information and we, we publish it out there, but we, we publish it from the lens of what does it mean for the business side? So more consumers are strength training or interested in strength training. What does that mean from a business perspective or the interest in search terms around longevity and the studies that came out that, you know, X and Y prove certain things, or, you know, today's newsletter, we're looking at consumers are looking for personalized nutrition, recent Deloitte study found that grocery shoppers are seeking fresh foods and looking at certain things. So we're finding those surveys, those studies, those research and data points and putting them out there. But, bringing it back to what does it mean if you operate as a business operator or entrepreneur, if you want to build a company in this space, how is that valuable? And then also looking at the news of company X bought company Y, company X is raising money, this company is doing this. Um, it's always from the business lens because our, our whole thing is the business of fitness, wellness, and health. When it comes to like, there, there is a lot of areas uh, that you focus on, right? There is the food, supplements, there is the like sport businesses, right? It could be studios, gyms, uh, different fitness concepts, etc. And then there is the what I could uh, consider third pillar, which is the technology that uh, could be used uh, within the the whole ecosystem. Out of those three, uh, do you feel like it's roughly distributed uh, towards all of them or any particular area is where you spend majority of your time? It's honestly way broader than that. It's, it's you know, it's what we look at is wellness. Everything is wellness. Truly nowadays, beauty and food and lifestyle and medicine and mental health and psychedelics and it is such a broad spectrum. One day we'll talk about mental health, psychedelics, and the research around ketamine therapy and talk therapy. And then the next day we'll talk about, you know, the growth in pickleball and the sports and active lifestyle and how that's helping people stay active. And then the following week we'll talk about um, food, personalized nutrition and how the consumer wants to have a different approach when grocery shopping and how they're buying whole foods versus processed foods. So um, it's, it's such a wide range and that's the exciting part. The market of fitness and wellness and health is so, so big and broad. And usually what happens when people talk about it, they talk about fitness, brick and mortar workouts, whatever, or they talk about digital health and they're talking about healthcare and payer provider health systems and certain medicines and things like that. And what we do is we bring it all together from one end of the, what butts up against consumerized healthcare, you know, the medicines, the Ozempics that people talk about, the different therapies and treatments and everything, mental health, you know, consumer healthcare, all the way across the spectrum is the stuff that we spend pretty much an equal amount of time in every day. Well, how does one navigate in such a wide range of uh, different products, activities, and uh, anything that is uh, happening in the space? How do you even uh, like uh, go through all of that to pick what's the right for you? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a decent amount of time to like read and not and digest everything and see what's going on out there and pick those topics and plans. And luckily, now we have a really good team of writers and and. Uh, editors and things, but honestly, it's a lot of it's driven from my personal interest. Okay. Like I read about this, this is intriguing to me. Um, like a study came out that yoga is helpful for longevity and health span make you, it helps you if you do it over time, if you do it in your, in, as you get older, especially in later, uh, ages, it has proven to be X amount more successful in eliminating injuries or doing other things. It's interesting to me. Uh, it's a fun topic to see what that could be. And I find it, read about it, spend a lot of time online looking at National Health Institute published papers and, you know, PubMed papers and studies that came out from Deloitte or McKinsey or some other place and, and just seeing what's cool. 
So where is your interest besides, you know, yoga that you just mentioned these days? What are some of the uh, two or three topics that are really close to your heart that uh, you try to focus on and take, uh, take some uh, good researches uh, to back it up? Yeah, for me, it's the phase around like um, integrating daily movement, walking, getting up, walking in the morning, walking at night, walking after meals. Um, I take this is a very rare occasion because I don't take video calls anymore. I take every phone call unless it like is a very needed and specific thing for a podcast or someone has to give a presentation. I take it walking. Uh, I refuse to get on a video. You have you can call my cell. We can walk and talk and I'll get 25,000 steps in a day if I have a lot of calls. Um, so that's one big area. And then the other one is, um, like mobility and movement health. How do you work out for better hamstring, knee, um, back movement, things that will help you move more as you age and move longer as well as like eliminate pains and like the movement mobility, and kind of functional movement things that come around that super interesting to me. And I'm spending a lot of time there personally. Are there any uh, tech gadgets that you find uh, extremely useful as you know, uh, we could also tap into like the, the tech side of things uh, a little bit. Uh, and it's funny to say, we were just joking about this. I don't, we don't really wear wearables or gadgets or anything. Joe and I were pretty simple of how we approach things. Um, from, I really like, uh, what is the name of it? It's pliability is the name of it. It's like a, a digital yep. brand. The yeah. stretch, stretching, uh, yeah, movement subscription. I like that. And then the ready state with Kelly Starrett, I do his too. They're like two movement programs apps that you can use that have those movement, um, protocols. I use those every day. Um, but yeah, not much. I mean, I wear an Apple watch only because it makes sure I don't miss meetings and it notifies me when, when I have meetings coming up and things happening, but no whoops, no auras, no tracking, no macro tracking, no devices. All of my, all of our equipment is offline. We don't have any connected fitness equipment in our gyms. Um, everything is pretty simple. Is that the mantra for the newsletter as well? Or in the newsletter, you also uh, go and, and cover those trackers? We cover them. We've written about them and, and look at them. But we always have the lens of, why, what does this help? Does this matter? Does this change? What is the difference here? Um, so we, we always, I think, keep a very skeptical eye on things, which is helpful in the end because we don't get too caught up in things. I feel like I'm on the other side of the spectrum because I like to measure things and uh, uh, I, I like to analyze and I like to see the, the progress, how uh, things are improving or not improving. So for me, it's a great source of data uh, to be able to look at uh, um, different uh, patterns and regimes and how it impacts sleep, etc. But I also am a big proponent that uh, we should be building tech to use less tech um, yep. and it's not always easy because uh, um, I think many digital products are meant to consume you, are meant to take more and more of your time rather than giving you time back. And I think that's where we need to shift the narrative that we should be relying on technology so we get our time back. And uh, ideally we can uh, spend uh, more time doing sports or going to nature. And uh, you talked about uh, taking those uh, meetings while walking. And I have to say that uh, it's something that I very much enjoy and I can easily uh, clock in uh, 10,000 steps uh, early in the day uh, while having uh, one to two hours of, of meetings and you don't even realize, but you basically get the steps in and you barely feel anything. Exactly. That's what I mean. It's, it's those type of things that integrated into your life. And I have nothing against trackers. I love, like I've done it. I've tried them. I've looked at them. I think I'm fortunate that my background makes it easy for me to kind of generally understand and know at a high level what is happening to me. Um, but yeah, I think those are super helpful 
And, um, but yeah, for me, it's like, what is the consistency? I mean, you running a company, doing certain things, your life gets pretty hectic sometimes. So it's like, how can I do things that I make sure I won't miss or that are simple and easy and sustainable for a very long time? Because I don't want to go back to 260 and get big and lift, do things again and have to, you know, lose weight and, and, and stop working out. And, you know, cause I mean, I've had those things where you're running a new company, you're launching a new thing and your life is 24 seven that and other parts of your personal life get crazy. And you're like, ah, I can't work out today. I can't do this today. And then three months go by and you haven't moved at all. And you aren't getting your steps in and you're just, you know, not feeling great and it catches up to you. So I think, um, for me, it's like, what can I do every day that I know I'm going to hit every day? What are some of the fitness concepts that are on your radar that you feel are either like rapidly growing right now or will be growing in the near future? I mean, it's already growing like crazy. It's the adjacent wellness things around, you know, hot and cold contrast therapy and um, what Huberman talks about a lot of like the movement side of getting up and seeing the sun in the morning and being outside in the morning and those types of things that's everywhere and everyone's talking about it and it's great. I think it's super useful. I don't think it's a magic potion that most people think it is, but I think it's to do those things. It's helpful and it's awesome. Uh, especially if you like them and, and they, they help for you because it doesn't always help for everybody, but that's what I think is front of mind for everybody. And then the other side of the fitness thing is I, I just see a lot of people from the research and data we've seen it, and we're excited about from a fitness perspective is, the, the social fitness hobbies, run groups, meetups, activities, people are really changing. They only have, they've limited time. Everybody's working a lot, trying to, to just kind of get by at this point. And I think mirroring your personal interests and your personal activities with the things you do for fitness. Um, you know, uh, I've started to get into trail running and it's like find a group of trail runners, do that thing, go, go on a trip and, and go run this new hike, trail, go hike this new thing, that type of stuff. I think it is, we're seeing a, a number of growth points there, especially when you look at like stuff coming out of Strava and other things. Are there any like, um, physical location, fitness concepts that, uh, uh, you really like that you go to on a regular basis, or it's mostly like these independent activities that you prefer? Uh, home gym. We're a home gym crowd built, built a really sick home gym and an office gym, uh, and go there. But it's, you know, we have the, we have all the stuff. We have the Olympic weights and kettlebells and all the fun gadgets and the, uh, assault fitness treadmills and the concept twos love the erg, love the ski erg is amazing. is insane. The, the stupid, oh, what is it? Rogue. I love ski erg as well. Yeah. That's crazy. The rogue echo bike crushes me all the time. Um, the salt bike crushes me all the time. So doing all that for sure. Um, and it's fun as a group, you know, we, we built a, a gym that's more, it's not an actual business anymore. We don't own any gyms that make money there. We built one just for friends and family and fun. Um, so having that at the office, like a space for that, where we live is cool to be able to have people come and meet up and work out together and do stuff. What's your take on, on group classes and the social side of fitness? Because it seems like uh, it's uh, it's proven to be really effective and powerful for, for many people to stick around with the habit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's awesome. It's been proven time and time again that whether it's a workout partner or someone you train with or going to the group side, it, it works. It, it's super valuable. And... Um, I'm up for anyone doing anything. If you want to do yoga, you want to do Pilates, you want to go to Orange Theory, you want to go to Berries, you want to join a CrossFit gym. Awesome. Super cool. Glad everyone's doing it. And I think they all work. I think in general, they all work. So um, I think it's it's valuable. And that's why we did what we did. We spent money and time to build a, a, a non-money-making gym for people in our community so we can all get together and work out because more people will work out. It's fun. And you get to see people... You might not have seen because you get a workout in life's crazy. You got kids, you're doing stuff and, uh, but you can probably make time to come work out for a half hour and you get to hang out with people you like. Or just keep moving, right? That's the name of the game. That's it. So what's been the inception so, uh, of, uh, you also investing and creating uh, a fund? How does it, uh, play together with, uh, 
you covering the latest and greatest things with the newsletter around mm-hmm. fitness and wellness. Um, how did how did you uh, start uh, uh, the investment activities as well? Yeah, for us, it is a natural extension of like we've built and sold a number of companies. Got started angel investing, uh, started advising a fund and working with other funds, and we really saw that most investors don't understand the industry because they don't come from it. And that made us mad. We pitched companies back in the day when we were founders and we knew our companies were good and they went on to sell and be worth a lot of money, but investors didn't invest because they didn't understand what they were doing. But then you see them back this product or thing or shiny gadget and you're like, that's stupid. No one's going to buy that. Um, So that really inspired us to want to be on the other end once we could. And then more importantly, this infrastructure we built with our newsletter, our podcast, our jobs board, the other newsletters that we own, we talked to hundreds of thousands of fitness executives and fitness, wellness, health executives, operators, investors. And because of that, in the way that we've done it with research and data and value, they come to us. So we meet founders early on because they're looking for data or they're looking for advice or they're looking for help. And this kind of, you call it like a, a deal flow, our flywheel of how we see companies and how we can vet them and other stuff. We're already doing the research. We're already talking about the things. The founders are already coming to us. We have better infrastructure than funds that manage a billion dollars because of this thing we've built, this flywheel. So it only made sense. Why would I want to just be an advisor or refer you to other funds when I see these companies, I should be investing in them and I should be making the decisions. And it kind of organically came from us building this really cool platform that we own. How do you go about and select the right companies to invest into? Because I know that uh, this is also a very tricky process and I would love to hear from you. What are some of the things that you are looking for, right? Where do you see the gaps in the market where you would like to enter? What what are the things that uh, make or break the deal for you? Yeah, it's um, it's hard because we weigh... There's, there's products you see that you know will make money, but they're kind of, they, they're not needed. Like back to the simplicity of fitness and wellness. Oh, this new supplement company came out. They come to us. We know they're going to sell a lot because it's celebrity backed and it's really cool branding and it's whatever. It's not needed. I couldn't personally recommend it to somebody. So we don't back it. And that sucks because you lose out on a good thing. You can make a lot of money on it. So it's somewhat hard. That's what we did personally when we were personally investing. And now with the fund, we still have that lens of, is this actually viable? Is it actually think we put our name on it and be backers of it? But on the other end, it's really just going against our data. Um, Every single week for hundreds of weeks, we've done research and published things that say, here's what the consumers want. Here's their data. Here's their information. Here's the growth. Here's the competitors. Here's the, the other decks from the competitors. Here's the market opportunity. So we just find companies and match them to unique opportunities we see through our research. And it's everything from fertility companies and products that are offering to, uh, you know, true med is when we just invested in not too long ago, which is providing HSA, a way for you to use your HSA and FSA payments for products. So I can buy my aura or my whoop or my eight sleep with HSA dollars, which is awesome. Um, recover athletics, one that we invested in that Strava bought, um, a, a movement mobility thing. Again, obviously personally interested in that for runners. So it's, uh, it's just taking pretty simple model of if you other way of saying this is if you're a founder and you build a product or you're building a product and you see, we've written about that and we've said, Hey, here's an opportunity, reach out to us. Cause we probably think there's a big opportunity there. It's because why we wrote about it. Well, you mentioned uh, multiple times that you have uh, already gone through selling a business. Um, And I would love to hear some of your insights into uh, how you go about that and if there are any uh, lessons learned that you would share with people that uh, are thinking about it or it might be something that they see on their future roadmap. And I would uh, even personally love to hear how you think about... uh, also going about selling the businesses because I find that uh, this is a craft of its own too. Mm -hmm. That's part of why we built, we've built is to not only find the best companies and help them, but then when they want to sell, you know, it's not about just falling into a sale, it's a target. 
you know, you find who you're going to sell to. You craft that plan, that relationship, that message. Previous companies we've sold, it's never like, oh, somebody came to us one day. It was like, hey, I want to buy your company. It was like, I'm going to sell to this company or I'm going to form a partnership with this company X amount of years from now. Let's get there. And I think that's the mistake that people make too, is they're like, oh, we'll just make a lot of money and somebody will knock on our door one day and say, hey, I want to buy your company. It's not the case. Or if it is the case, we've done that before. You usually don't get the best deal and it usually doesn't work out well. So one, it's about crafting that plan and knowing early on if you do plan on selling, which you don't always have to, um, if you do plan on selling, who you're selling to and why and what is that path to get there. Um, and then the other side is, it's again, funny to say, don't raise that much money unless you are really going to be this big for somebody who runs a venture firm. It's dumb for me to say, but most companies, especially ones that we've run and ones that we've seen, and we see thousands of them on a, on a regular basis, a lot of them don't need to raise money or raise very little money because in the end, if you don't protect your preferences from the investors and the term sheets are built the right way and the, the voting structure and the terms aren't, aren't, structured in a way that is helpful to you, you can get screwed big time. Whether you don't make money on the end or you aren't allowed to sell because you're bored or your investors aren't going to vote the right way. So I think it's in the process of building and raising money, make sure you have the right ownership and control and structure that you need to. Um, and then target the person you want to sell to and don't just stroll into it. We knew from the beginning we wanted to build and sell to this type of company or this group or this persona. And we're going to get there by doing these things. How do you structure the plan if you would, uh, wouldn't mind going uh, more into the details? When is the right time to start thinking about, okay, I have an exit strategy in mind. Uh, let's try to identify who might be the potential buyers. Uh, how, do you, how do you go about identifying who are uh, the uh, potential targets that are on your hit list? And is it... Uh, strategic? Is it financial? There might be also like uh, different kinds of uh, potential acquirers, right? Exactly. Even for the business we're building now, let's play Fit Insider for an example. Um, in theory, we, we have built a B2B media platform. And in the world of B2B media, there's very easy targets to go to. There's PE firms and groups like Industry Dive and Aging Media and others out there that would buy us because we're a media business and we make money from media. That's not interesting to me. What's interesting is, and why we built what we've built, is venture capital is getting really competitive. And family offices and other PE firms, it's very competitive. And if you had a way to identify and support and grow companies with a better, you know, statistic, with better statistics to show that you can do that and make more money in the end, how much money is that worth? It's worth a lot more than the media business. So that's what we're doing. We will want to sell Fit Insider one day or just continue to raise a bunch of money from the funds. But in the end, we have identified very large family offices and funds and PE groups that have no competitive advantage. They just manage money. And if they were to have a access point, a deal flow channel, a support system, a talent group, all of the stuff that we do, and they could identify better companies, invest in better companies and sell for better returns... That is worth an untold amount of money for them if they manage 700 million, but you know, a billion beyond that. And there's no one building that in the health and wellness market broadly. So that is from day one when I started sending a newsletter to five of my friends. I had that in mind all along was what is this going to be worth? It's not just some media company. It's that thing. And that's how thoughtful Joe and I are with the companies we invest in, the things we build, the things we do. It's like, I don't have to sell this. I could run it and raise my own billion dollar fund over time, which would be awesome. But in the end, what is my time to that return on capital and money that I'm putting up? And what is the sale potential? It's, you know, firm X that manages, a you know, $750 million and is about to raise another fund. They need a competitive advantage and I built it out of the box for them. They need to buy us. What were your thoughts when you were sending that first newsletter? Uh, did you think that you would uh, make it as big as uh, it is today? Or uh, what What were you thinking back then? I thought I would have sold it sooner, for sure. Uh, we, <laughs> we had a bunch of opportunities to. Probably should have taken some of them because they were 
it's early on, they were high numbers for what was very basic stuff, but the plan was there. Uh, but, um, yeah, the plan early on was nobody knew the industry quite like we did. Cause I started as a literal trainer on the ground, training somebody at like a YMCA or like in a park and all the way from somebody that understood strength and conditioning and fitness and training to where we are now, that perspective and experience I thought was different because just most investors and groups didn't know that. And we saw fitness being so much bigger than it is today. Um, and where it's going to go and fitness and wellness and health. Very early on, we identified these opportunities and we said, no one talks about it. Club industries and, you know, URSAs and, you know, now there's like 20 different scammy bullcrap newsletters and sites out there that mostly steal our content, which is funny enough. But um, <laughs> they, they just talk about nothing. They publish press releases, they do this. But when you think about if you want data research, thought leadership information, back when we started sending a random newsletter in 2019, no one was doing that, but the industry is valued at trillions of dollars. There was just a huge gap. So we're like, Oh, we have to do this to get to this end goal. And, um, luckily it worked out. Sometimes it doesn't. Well, how did your mindset change from being uh, a trainer, being a fitness coach to, uh, today being an entrepreneur, running a big business, scaling it on multiple fronts? Uh, what, what has changed in your mind? Big thing for me is I, I, I'm very good at a zero to one, come up with the idea, hustle, figure it out, get it going. But I'm not a, like a day-to-day -day operator. I'm not good at staying organized. I'm not good at doing certain tasks that are needed as you scale. So I'm lucky that my brother and business partner is very good at that. But then also um, early on, I thought I could do everything. Oh, I'm going to be the guy that does, I'm going to be really good at, taxes. I'm going to be really good at brands and logos and marketing and websites and everything else. And like, I'll do it. Terrible idea. My big thing now and what's carried us for the past, you know, seven, eight years with the number of businesses we've built, um, develop a really thoughtful and strategic idea, research it, plan it, but then immediately find the right people, partners, firms, agencies, groups, designers, really talented, stable of people pay them well, give them equity, work with them, let them do the work because they're good at it. And you just drive the, drive the bus and you're the in charge, but you bring these people around. And now we we're fortunate that we have this stable of people. So when we do want to launch a thing or build a company or whatever, we know who we're going to and they love us. They trust us. They're great partners and I'll go to them every day. What do you see as the most exciting opportunity of uh, something that is not part of your portfolio, but, uh, you feel it would be a great addition of it. Yeah. One thing Joe and I are really excited about is because we talk to this executive group, this B2B group, what other things can we sell them? Is it a SaaS product? Is it, you know, do we want to bring on events? Do we want to offer agencies? Like the recruiting firm is our next biggest project. Um, that's ex super exciting. We talk to all of these job seekers. We know all of the companies health, wellness, fitness, health tech, recruiting is a massive business. Finding and placing these people at these roles. Well, all of those people read our newsletter. Why am I not the one placing them? Why is our company not doing that? So that's our, our next, next most exciting thing. It's not public yet. We're doing it behind the scenes in beta and working on it, but um, we'll be launching that soon. And uh, that is so exciting for us to be able to connect the dots and bring talented people to really cool companies um, and obviously it's a good business. And then secondarily, it's the agency world partnering and or acquiring certain agencies that provide services to the health and wellness market. Um, we are in talks right now with a few, but again, we already have these relationships. We know these people, can we partner or, or do something that accelerates the growth and provides more services and helps get more clients and builds really cool products. Um, so that's what we're working on right now or SaaS products that we could sell to them that are something that their companies need or they need that are valuable. Is there one thing that uh, you wish you would have known before you began? Uh, something that uh, was a big obstacle and that you would do differently now? Yeah, I think it's the media landscape is very complicated. It's, um, you know, it's a boring number of like subscribers and growth and, you know, 
all of these certain things where you could listen to podcasts and read about people, how to hack growth, growth hacking type thing. We tried that a few times, eh, put out really good content, stay with it. We've blown and wasted a ton of money on paid growth and marketing and growth hacking and all their things. When in reality, the only thing that's helped us grow into where we are is like heavily index on building the best possible content and product to put out there and doing it very consistently so that every week they know on Tuesday, the newsletter's coming on Wednesday, the podcast is coming on Friday. We're posting the jobs roundup every day at 9.00 AM Monday through Friday, writing jobs to the jobs board. That's it. That's like the secret sauce of everything we've ever done. When similar to like the fitness concept, I need gadgets and things and wearables and other stuff. You really don't need that. And we've, wasted a shit ton of money doing dumb stuff when we could have just consistently done what we've done to date. I think it's a great realization that uh, being consistent and uh, producing uh, an extremely high quality work uh, yields a lot of results. Yeah, again, boring. Nothing exciting coming from me today. It's all the most basic stuff, whether fitness or entrepreneurship. It's like, but I've, I've spent so much of my life getting distracted by I bought this cool thing or I'm trying this new workout plan or diet, or I'm going to this new training and workshop. Similarly on the entrepreneur side, it's like, Oh, we're paying this new growth hacking firm and we're running these special ads and we're doing this thing. But in the end, our interests and what has worked for us, at least personally and professionally, it's like do the basics really freaking well and become an expert at operating in those. And then having the people around you operate in those. And usually you'll win. And at least that's what, I've seen. It's the basic things and uh, they work. They're proven, right? Yeah. So far, anyway. Well, right? if, <laughs> um, if you could say two or three things that you would really like uh, for people uh, listening, watching to this podcast uh, to remember and to take away, what would it be? Yeah. Um, I think the first one is the fitness and wellness side, don't complicate it, make it work for you, make it easy and, um, just find what being healthy means to you. Cause it's different. And I've had my own health scares over time and it used to be, I want to bench X amount of weight and do all kind of crazy stuff. And now it's like, I just want to feel good. So what works for you and what's important to you is, is all that matters and do that. And then, um, the other side of it is I want people to build in the health and wellness space. I want people that aren't trainers and coaches and instructors and that have never worked in it to come and build companies in it. And you should tell us about it and maybe we'll invest in it because again, what's cooler than building something that impacts all of these people's lives. There's like a few subjects, health and wellness, um, and fitness. I think climate tech is cool and like ag tech and like making access to food or things that help the environment are really cool. So like build in that, do something impactful. Don't make another stupid app that people go and, you know, some, I don't know, some SaaS thing, some boring thing, make something impactful, come to our space, do it. There's a lot of money in it. It's super fun. And then tell me about it because that'd be cool to talk to you and see what's going on. Thank you so much for listening or watching to the very end. I hope that can only mean one thing, that you really enjoyed it. And if you did, please go ahead and follow us, subscribe or write a review and it will be tremendously appreciated by our side. In the meantime, there are a bunch of other episodes that you can check out. And I'll be looking forward to catching you next time.